Hello, I'm David Edler. I'm the engineering manager for LexDUI, and today I would like to present to you LexD 6.5, the newest release of LexD. And here we see a little demo environment running LexD 6.5 with the UI version 0 0.18 included. And the first new thing I want to show you is a setting. So let's go to set settings and search for theme. So now the UI automatically picks up by default the system theme. So if your system theme is light, you get the previous experience as you see it here. If your system preference is the dark theme, you would automatically get that. You can also force a dark theme or the light theme. With the dark theme, you can see all the pages, detail pages of instances, lists like profiles, networks, and also network detail pages. They all apply to the dark theme. It works out of the box thanks to the vanilla framework we're using. And yeah, let's go back to the default system theme. The second feature, a little bigger. So let's go into networks. So we have here a list of networks. We see some non-managed physical networks on the individual cluster members. And we have cluster-wide managed networks, an uplink and an open network, DEF. Let's create a new network. We added two new types, which is a MacVLAN type and the SRIOV type. They have nearly the same options both with the only difference that MacVLAN also has this GARP registration option where you can say yes or no. Both of them relate to physical networks on each cluster member, or if it's a single instance, to physical networks on that host. And as this is a cluster, we saw we have three nodes. We can change the parent device for the MacVLAN or for the SRIOV network that we're creating here. If I toggle this, then we see each cluster member individually, and I can change the physical device being used on that member for this very network. We have more in networking. The second thing is if you go to an oven network or a bridge, you will see the leases because both of these network types hand out IP addresses. Before there wasn't a place to see which IP addresses are used by this network. Be aware this view, it's project specific. So here we see the gateway because we're in the default project and this network is defined in it. And then we see three instances, which we also can see here, which have a network attached, this very network, and which IP addresses they have registered even though they are stopped currently. And we also see the MAC address for those. There's one more instance in the robots. If we go to the robots project, we see this instance. It's also connected to, if we look here, we see it's also connected to this network. DEF. And if you go to leases, we see this is project aware. So here we don't see the gateway. We don't see the other instance appearing. So if we go back to the default project, we will only see default project instances here, which brings me to another feature that we added, which is the IP address management screen, which is global. It gives you a list of all networks, all instances from all projects and all the IP addresses that have been assigned by Lexi together with the net addresses if these are instances. So that's a pretty nifty summary if you're doing troubleshooting or if you want to just have an overview of your IP address real estate. Uh, the last new feature in networks is directly attached to the instances. You might have already seen it here that we added the MAC address to the instance overview page. So every network adapter will list a MAC address here. And for ease of use, also from the instance list page, if you open the side panel by clicking on the instance, not on the on this link here, but on any other space, you open the side panel and the side panel also contains the MAC address. So you can quickly cycle through your instances and get the MAC address from here. Coming to the next bigger block, which is about clustering. The cluster pages have changed. There are now dedicated pages for the cluster members and the cluster groups. We have just one default group in this setup and we have three cluster members. We can browse to their detail pages, which gives us an exhaustive view of this cluster member. We see this one is currently a database leader here and the other two nodes, they were other database. One new thing we have is the hardware view. So for each cluster member, you can see stuff like uptime load average, but also details about the hardware, like which CPU is in use, which GPU is available, how's the memory confined, which hardware cards for networking are available, which storage. 
which PCI devices, also USB devices, if there would be any here, there are none. And this is available for every single cluster member. So you can really dig into what hardware is building my cluster. That brings me to the groups page, which is there for managing your cluster members and creating groups of them. By default, you have a default group, which consists of all cluster members. So you can manage it here, you can remove. You can also create a new group. Let's say we have a GPU nodes and let's say only micro two and micro three have a dedicated GPU. So we could create a group from here and there we have it. We can now use it when creating instances, we can target Let's choose a base image and now we can see the cluster members available, micro one, two, and three. If we change the group to the GPU nodes group, we only have two and three. This new instance, if we would target a host to run this instance, which has a physical GPU available. So this is the groups feature lasting on the members. Members can be managed in the sense you can evacuate a cluster member. When you evacuate it, you can choose what should happen to the instances that are on this node, you can stop them. You can choose to migrate them to other members or you can live migrate them. Let's say stop them, we can evacuate and as it's completed, and then we can also restore the member at a later stage and the UI tells you it's done with that action. So you can use that evacuate and restore to update micro one without interfering with the instances running on this host. Hello everyone, my name is Inkira and I'm a part of the LXD UI team. Today I'm going to teach you how to import and export custom storage volumes in LXD 6.5. This feature allows you to manually backup and restore storage volumes. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'm on my volumes page right now and I'm going to select my desired volume, custom storage volume, and then from the top right hand corner, click on export. Now from here, there are a number of different configuration options that I can choose for the exported volume, such as its compression, expiration time, and also the version of the export. This particular volume has one snapshot, but I'm going to select export without volume snapshots so that these are not included in my export. Once I click export volume, a download will be started. And once it has successfully completed, I can navigate to create a new volume and upload my volume file in the volume creation menu. I can also configure the storage pool that this volume will go into, as well as the target cluster member if you're in a clustered environment. I'm going to click on upload and create. And almost straight away, we have our new volume right here with us. If I click on this, there are no snapshots because I selected that none should be included, but all of the other configuration options are included as well. Today, I'm going to be teaching you how to create and manage storage buckets and their keys in LXD 6.5. Let's get straight into it. So we're going to start out on our buckets page. And from here, we can click on create a bucket, which will open up a side panel where we can fill in a number of configuration options for our bucket. I'm going to call this bucket one. Within LXD 6.5, you do need to use a Ceph object storage pool. And there are details on how to set up a Ceph object storage pool in the LXD documentation. I can also add a size and description to my bucket, but for now, I'm just going to skip that. Let's create our bucket. Great. So we can see our bucket in our bucket list page at the moment. And if we hover on top of it, we can edit its configuration items or delete it. To manage the bucket keys, we can click on the bucket. And now we can see all of the keys associated with this bucket, including the one that was automatically generated upon creation. We can also amend and delete bucket keys. To create a new key, we can click on create key and enter the name. Let's call it bucket key one. We can adjust the role of bucket key one, as well as add a description, access key and secret key. If you create the key without adding an access or secret key, then it will automatically generate these details for you. Amazing. Now we have our second bucket key, bucket key one. That's all for today.